All right, welcome back to episode 60 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh, as always, joined by Troy. Kind of a sad start to the show, Troy. Got to admit. <laughs> Very depressing. Ollie will, I will give the Minnetonka High School girls hockey state tournament update. Pretty sad. We won our first game. Great. Made the semifinals. Proceeded to lose. Made the third place game and proceeded to lose that. So very disappointing end of the season. Great season overall, but very disappointing end. Well, that's sports for you. Looked like the girls gave it their all. We were at my daughter's season-ending hockey party, and we had about 40 people cheering for you around the TV on Friday night when you guys were in the semifinals. But you lost close games, so yeah. could have gone either way. I guess the other thing I want to say before we get going is uh, thank you to everyone who listened to our last episode and our master class on the Cup with Mitch Grotman. We've gotten wonderful feedback, and most of the credit there goes to Mitch because we were active listeners. That's probably was our role, Troy. Yep. And again, he did a fantastic job. I just want to thank everyone for listening. And hey, go ahead and tell your friends because Mitch had some great information there. Last thing then is just a reminder that the Hockey Cards Gone Show podcast is a Patreon podcast. That means that we rely on the support of listeners like yourself to help us cover our expenses and really make the show possible. And beyond that, help us to produce more and better hockey hobby content and even support hobby growth in even a small way. It's really easy to support us. All you got to do is go to Patreon and we have a $5 a month out of 99 support level tiers. So be one of the first 99 supporters of our show. And when you do so, you get access to the Gong Show Discord. You can chat with us and everyone else in the community on a regular basis. It's really easy to do. Like I mentioned, you can go to HockeyCardsGongShow.com, our website, and click on the Become a Patron link there. Go to the Patreon website, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. There's a link in the show description on the podcast app you're listening to us on right now. Or finally, in our Instagram and TikTok profiles, we have a link tree where the link is there. We do, Troy, have one new member since our last show. want to give our heartfelt Thank you to Dollar Rookies, big 90s hockey fan, which is awesome because I love 90s hockey too. His little plug that he asked for is, and I love these, Troy, is he's putting together a 98-99 Bowman's Best Atomic Refractor set. Currently, he's made some good progress. He's got 95 out of the 150 cards. And so if you have any, please message him on Instagram at dollar underscore rookies. Ready for the game plan? Definitely. We start today's show by looking at the greatest NHL player to wear number 60. Then it's off to who's hot and the struggle bus. Next, we take a look at hobby news. We then share our initial thoughts and reactions to the 2020 Upper Deck the Cup release. We end the show with new product releases, followed by a look at the Athletics NHL 99 list. All right, Josh, here we go. Number 60. Hockey's most famous number 60 per the hockey writer's greatest player to wear each number article is Jose Theodore. I always want to say Jose, <laughs> and I know that's not right. It's Jose. Jose. All right. Uh, hey, we, we got, I think we got the pronunciation right for once. So I think I got that's it. Jose, awesome. Jose Theodore. Overview. I always think it's weird too when goalies are not like one 30, 31 or 32, something like that. When you see like, 60 or like Stuart Skinner yeah. at 74. That just seems so weird to me. Yeah, I think it's the days of the goalies having to stick to the one or the 30s is over. They're just kind of doing what they want now. All right, Jose Theodore, goalie. And we break our streak of active players as Theodore is currently retired. So we had a good run. I think we had three shows in a row or three episodes in a row with an active player, but no more. Theodore played in 648 regular season games over a 16-season NHL career. Theodore played his first eight and a half seasons with the Montreal Canadiens. This was followed by stints with Colorado, Washington, Minnesota, which I kind of conveniently forgot about, and Florida. Josh, do you I remember didn't... him playing for Florida for Minnesota? No. Yeah, he was a backup for Baxter. He actually did pretty well when he was here, too. Yeah, All I right. don't remember that. Yeah, I did. I totally, totally forgot. Awards and accomplishment. He was the 2002 Hart Trophy winner. He was the 2002 Vesna Trophy winner. 
Here's an interesting one. He was the 2002 Roger, I'm going to say the name wrong, Crozier Saving Grace Award winner. This award was given to a goaltender who finished the regular season with the best save percentage in the National Hockey League. Only goalies who played 25 games or more in the season were eligible for the award. It stopped being awarded in 2007. I must have just forgot about that award because I don't even remember hearing about it, but it hasn't been around for a while. He was also the 2010 Masterson Trophy Award winner. And if you forget what that is, it is given annually to the NHL player who best exemplifies the qualities of perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to ice hockey. He is also a two-time participant in the NHL All-Star Game and a one-time NHL Second Team All-Star. So we're back to our good old first team and second team All-Stars, even though it's not really an All-Star, it's an after the season award. All right. No, I just forward. looked up, Troy. Oh, go ahead. Real quick, because I was curious that only six goalies have ever won the Hart Trophy. Yeah, it's not a lot. And then I was thinking, too, because he won, obviously, the Venza, Vesna the same year, too. Under what circumstance could a goalie win the Hart and not the Vesna? Is that even possible, do you think? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that shouldn't be possible. My mind. Yeah, you could, no. you could definitely go the other way. You can win the Vesna, but not the Hart. But winning the Hart and not the Vesna, that's that's chaos. That would well, four deep. of the six are very old. Like I'll admit, I don't, like, Roy Warders, Chuck Rayner, Al Rollins. And then Jacques Plant, Dominic Hoshik, and Jose Theodore. Yeah, so, we're, we're get a little. Club. We'll get a little tidbit about his award winning streak okay. there in 2002 in the in the fun facts. Okay. All right, for his career, Theodore had a record of 286 wins, 254 losses, 69. We'll call them tie slash overtime losses. He had a career goals against average of 2.68 and a career save percentage of .909 with 33 shutouts. Made the playoffs in nine of his 16 NHL seasons, compiling a record of 21 wins, 30 losses, and 56 games played. He had a career playoff goals against of 2.79 with a .912 save percentage and two shutouts. Best season of his career, obviously we heard about those 2002 Hart and Vesna awards, was his 2001-2002 season with Montreal, when Jose Theodore compiled a record of 30 wins, 24 losses, we'll say 10 ties, and 67 games played. That season, he had a goals against average of 2.11 and a save percentage of 0.931 and seven shutouts. All right, now I had to get, I had to look at Theodore more in depth because I, I, I don't really remember him that well. I knew, I knew he won a Vesna. I knew that. I didn't realize he won a Hart, too, and how that he kind of had a career year that one year. <laughs> So I had to look at him and yeah. do a little analysis to see exactly what his style was. And if you look at his bio, obviously by today's standards, he was definitely a smaller goalie, 5'11". I think he was listed as 175 pounds, so definitely tinier than we expect in today's game. However, being that tiny goalie, I watched a little bit of video. You see strong, quick movements, very good positioning. Has to do this to make up for a smaller frame. Has to be square to a puck and square to the puck in a, in a good position to take away as much net as possible being he came into the league around the mid 90s he kind of has that mix of stand-up and butterfly style when he started his career which is really odd to see stand-up goalies like how the game has transitioned to everything's butterfly and so much is on the ground seeing that stand-up style is a little <laughs> like takes me takes me a little bit second to get used to but as his career progressed if you watch videos later in his career he goes right he's butterfly style just like everyone else Part of my ignorance here, but so did stand-up goalies never go down on their pads? Or? They would go, they would go down, but they were taught more to like do. I mean, it's like standing kick saves. Now, I'm not saying Theodore's out there doing standing kick saves, but they were they didn't go down as much for sure. And it was more get in front of the shot and be in a good position because the thought being like we're in the old days, they would do skate saves, which is literally just. Shot comes in, don't use your stick, turn your skate and deflect it to the corner. Just the most random stuff that they did. Huh. But definitely the game has progressed a little a little past that. So now they're and plus the people today are just fantastic athletes. They're better athletes than than the previous players back in the sure. 40s, 50s, etc. All right. So that's kind of a little bit about his style. Overall, if you look at his career, he definitely peaked in that 2001, 2002 season, as we can see by the awards and what he won, but he was still a top NHL goalie. I would put him in the top, maybe 15 for most of his career as he played. And even when he got to the later tail end of his career, he still had a couple of 30 plus win seasons. However, obviously he was 
near 500 for his win loss record for his career, but definitely a good goalie. Had a career year, definitely capitalized on it. So it was interesting to read and do some research on Jose Theodore. All right, we got to get to fun facts. These are a little, I got four of them. So I'll I'll start with the first one. January 2nd, 2021. That can't be right. It's not 2021, maybe 2001. Theodore scored a goal when he attempted to clear the puck from the defensive zone against the New York Islanders and scored into the empty net. So he's a goalie that's down. He scored a goal, I think. I, I looked it up. I want to say it's 13 or 14 currently that have scored in the NHL. However, with okay. that goal, he is the second goalie ever to record a goal and a shutout in the same game. However, he was the first goalie to directly score a goal and record a shutout in the same game, meaning he shot the puck into the net. So that gives him he directly scored a goal and he got a shutout. First goalie to do that. However, Damian Rhodes got a shutout and scored a goal, but before him, but Damian Rhodes actually was the last player to touch a puck, and then the other team shot it in their own net on accident when they oh, had an open net. Gotcha. So it's one of those little quirks, and just because I got to tie everything back to me, I guess, Damian Rhodes was my goalie coach in a couple summers at Richfield. Oh, wow. That's, that's where he's from. All right. And it obviously helped you in your NHL career. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, that definitely helped me. I uh, had zero NHL career or college career in hockey. All right, Jose Theodore's Hart Trophy and Vesna wins in 2002 have a little bit of an interesting history behind them. Both awards resulted in a tie for first place, and both times the two leading finalists had exactly 70% of the vote. However, Theodore won both as a result of having more first place votes over... A, why do I have so much trouble with this guy's name? I know it's easy. Jerome Aginla? Aginla. I always want to say Aguilia. It's a Ginla for the heart and Patrick Waugh for the Vesna. So oh, that's wow. kind of interesting little tidbit. He tied, but he had more first place votes. So he gets them both. So he All barely right. won both of them. Yeah, barely. And then last fun fact. I don't know if this is a fun fact or just kind of, I don't know what this is. When NHL hockey resumed in the 2005, six season after the previous year's lockout, it was reported that Theodore failed a random drug test prior to the 2006 winter Olympics. The drug he tested positive for was Propecia, which, if you know anything about that, is for hair loss. He had received a therapeutic use exemption from the NHL, but the international governed body does not care about that. They slapped him with a two-year ban from international competition due to the drug being used as a masking agent. However, it seems like Theodore was probably losing his hair and actually <laughs> had a good reason to use it. But it's kind of funny that that's the reason you got banned for two years, because you were trying to use Propecia. For hair loss. Do goalie helmets promote hair loss? I don't know. You know, you've heard, I think that's like probably an old wives say like a hat. Uh, Wear yeah. a hat will cause you to go bald or something. But anyways, lots of good information. Really interesting player to look up. I love it when it's goalies. All right, his rookie card. This is not going to go well. He's a 1995-96 <laughs> upper deck, number 530. This is one of our favorites, the World Junior Cup cards. So it's his rookie card. I could barely I couldn't find any sales within the last, I don't know, two years. The PSA 10 version is 20, it's a pop 25, gem rate of 21%. Last sale I could find was an eBay auction in 2019 for $37. The BGS 9.5 has a pop of 48, gem rate of 17%. Most recent cop I could find was around $26 via eBay on May 16th of 2021. There if are you take a World Juniors card and you scratch out, Jose Theodore, and you write in Connor Bedard. There you goes go. From thirty-seven dollars to thirty-seven thousand dollars. <laughs> exactly. So you can find raw versions of this. It's not going to cost you a lot. That's what we got. All right, number sixty, Jose Theodore. Want to make a quick mention for Gong Show partner and sponsor, Stand Up Displays, who offer amazing stands to display your favorite hockey cards at home or around the office. Check out standupdisplays.co to see their full line of city and jersey stands of players like Patrick Waugh, Wayne Gretzky, Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin, Connor McDavid, etc. They're in the process right now, Troy, of producing the Austin Matthews city and jersey stand that we all voted on as part of our Gong Show poll a week or so ago, and that should be available soon on their website. Or if you'd like a custom stand, they do those too. Really affordable. You get them pretty fast especially if you use their direct print product. So go to 
standupdisplays.co and use the code gongshow at checkout and you'll save 10%. Can they do a parallel stand with a big moustache on it? Like a little AM34 and a big moustache and that'll be the parallel. We're going to get, I'm going to get parallels and everything. There's cards, there's parallels and comic books. Let's go to stands next. I'm ready. That would be awesome. Just a big mustache <laughs> in, in the Maple Leafs colors with AM34 on it. I'm going to have to do a Drak Prince stand there. For, there you go. I, don't know if I, I, really have I good, could do it. Yeah, I could do it. I don't know if I have any good Matthews cards, though. That would be even worth displaying on it. But we just gave, you, try, you just gave Dan and Stan up a million dollar <laughs> idea. There we go. It would be a chat from us, chat with us from his yacht, I guess. Okay, let's move to Who's Hot and the Struggle Bus. So the Gong Show Discord had a lot of nominations this week, right? For Who's yep. Hot and the Struggle Bus. On the Who's Hot side, we had players like Adrian Kempe, Hugh Suter, Patrick Kane, to name a few on the struggle bus side, Tomas Hurdle, and Jacob Markstrom. So we definitely took these into consideration and used a few. But we got behind our Gong Show supercomputer. <laughs> and here's who we What do you have we... this supercomputer? Because I don't know where it's at. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a there's a new sound effect that you already just heard. So <laughs> pretend like it was funny. On the who's hot side, it's really hard, Troy, not to probably seems cliche, but how do you not go with Connor McDavid? Yeah, should we just point? give him a permanent seat on the who's hot list? And now we jinxed him. Now now he'll be on the struggle bus, but whatever. So he's of course the NHL scoring leader and only had uh, twelve points in the last four games <laughs> over oh the past God. week. That's it, just twelve. That includes an even distribution, Troy, of six goals and six assists. Wow. McDavid now is up to 133 points in 60 games played. That is a 154-point pace for the season at a 1.83 point per game average. Is he really at 133? That, that, does, that doesn't seem right. That seems like he scored a lot of points since he reached 100. Come on, Josh. The supercomputer didn't catch that or what? Yeah. Gong Show supercomputer has <laughs> bad, the frets. bad software, I guess. I think I did a typo there, so I'm looking at 113, 113 points. 113 points, Troy. <laughs> Told you it was 113. <laughs> so McDavid is up to 113 points in 60 games played. I believe that's 154 points piece for the season. 1.83 points per game average, like I said. Getting back to his season pace for a second, right, that is 154 points. If he got 154, that would be the 15th highest point total in a season ever in the history of the NHL. Wayne Gretzky has the most points ever in a season, of course, 215 in the 1985-86 season. And, Troy, there's been five players to ever score 150 points or more in a season. Gretzky did it nine times because he's a show-off. <laughs> Lemieux did it four. Iserman won. Bill Esposito won. And then Bernie Nichols won. So from a stats perspective here, we're talking about a potentially historic season that he's working on. Yeah, especially in today's game with how skilled and how good players are. But we've read enough articles, the goalies stink now. So here we go. I'm not saying I'm rooting for this, but wouldn't it be interesting if he got like 156 points or something like that and they get bounced in the first round again? I know. Like, how does the hobby digest that? You watch their games. He truly is like a man among boys out there at times. It is crazy. Just you can have four people on him and he just weaves through them does his thing, comes down, gets a shot. Might not score every time, but <laughs> it is pretty nuts watching him right now. Even highlight reel for sure. Just covering his hockey cards perspective, he, of course, is a 2015 young gun. His PSA 10 popped 2,464 with a 53% gem rate. Last sold, Troy, for 3,137 U.S. dollars. It's down about 2% in the past month. So McDavid continues to light up the league. The next guy, Troy, and who's hot, is it's his first time on our show. Patty Kane, Patrick Kane. Mm, you familiar? Ever heard I'm of him? Very familiar. In the news a lot. Yeah. Maybe also known as trade bait at this point, <laughs> right? Would that be uh, more on that in a little bit, though? He's had a pretty impressive week as he, I guess, puffs out his chest, letting teams like the Rangers know what he can still do, even at 34 years young. His last four games played, not quite McDavid in. McDavidian, he has seven goals, three assists for 10 points. That's so pretty good. Including a Hattie try on February 19th against Toronto. 
for the season, been a little bit of a down year for Kane. 16 goals, 29 assists, 45 points, and 54 games played. Pacing in about the mid-60s area for points. I think, of course, the biggest question that everyone is asking or waiting to be resolved is what team is he on by the time next week comes around when the trade deadline's passed. From a hockey perspective, Kane is a 2007 young gun. In his PSA 10, pop only 351 with a 37% gem rate. Mm. Last sold for 851 US dollars on February 21st, down about 21% over the past three months. Do you see his prices spiking if and when I he do. gets uh, traded I for the Rangers? So. I think he so. Because it's a, a better team. And... and even though we didn't really see much with Tarasenko, I think Kane is different in that regard. But we'll see what happens. We had McDavid, Patrick Kane. Who else is on? Who's hot? Troy. All right. We got, it sounds, I had a little deja vu, but we have Dawson Mercer now on the Who's Hot. And guess what? He was an episode 56 struggle bus. He must have really not liked being on the struggle bus because he was named to it and decided right then and there that he's had enough and that, and that he wanted off. I don't know if it stunk, probably too smelly in there with some of those guys that have been in there for a while. But yeah, he jumped off in a big way. Over the past two weeks, in seven games played, Mercer has eight goals, two assists for 10 points. This season has been pretty good for Mercer, 19 goals, 20 assists, 39 points in 59 games, on pace for 54 points, which I believe is more than he had last year. I'm going off memory here, so don't don't yell at me if I'm wrong. Currently, he has moved up the depth chart. He When he was on the struggle bus, he had got moved down to the third line. He's now on the first line with Thomas Tatar and Nico Hersher. Or how do you say it? Hishire? I don't know. His year. His year. There you go. He has remained also on the second power play unit, as he was when he was on the struggle bus. His rookie guard is 2021 at Young Guns. PSA 10 has a pop of 481 with a gem rate of 64%. Current sales have been in the $65 to $75 range, which is up from the beginning of February when it trended around the $30 to $55 range. So jumping off the struggle bus, I'm just going to equate means your prices go up. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, Troy. There it is. The struggle bus is back, of course. Perfect timing, like we've come to expect. And this first one is a doozy. So I think I mentioned before that, a few times anyways, that we use Quant Hockey a lot to help us figure out who's hot and who should be on the struggle bus because they – do stat rankings by, you can look at them by week or by two weeks, by month for the season, however you want to mm-hmm. slice and dice it there. So in looking at candidates for the struggle bus for today's show, I did a little search of all 60, 678 NHL players over the past week, Troy, and coming in dead last as number 678, according <laughs> to Quant Hockey, for hockey performance is uh, Matt Boldy from your oh. Minnesota Wild. Sad. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing there. So, Troy, you got uh, we got that going for us, which is so nice. he's he really really playing up to that new contract, isn't he? Yeah. In four games played over the past week, he has zero points with a minus two plus minus in about eighteen minutes of average time on ice for the season. Boldy's at sixteen goals, twenty three assists for thirty nine points in fifty nine games played. He also had 39 points last year, but in only 47 games played. So he's kind of one of these guys, a little bit like Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond, a little bit of a sophomore slump mm-hmm. this year. To kind of echo that a little bit. So he's at 0. 0.66 points per game this year compared to 0.83 last season. He's at 0. 0.27 goals per game compared to 0.32. Uh, I did not major in statistics in college, Troy, but that that's not a jump, I don't think. No, that does not seem good. So what do you think is going on with Boldy? Is it just more the whatever's going on with the Wild? that? Yeah, it's probably a, I don't know, macro thing. The Wild have been kind of stinking. It's probably, I don't know if pressure just of this of the expectations of him, because they've talked him up. I mean, Garen loves him. They keep talking about him. Then he signs the seven-year, $49 million contract. So I don't know if that's adding to the more pressure on him, which you'd hope it wouldn't, because... You're pretty secure now for the next seven years of your life. So start playing some good hockey, hopefully. I don't know. It's uh, It stinks. I don't like seeing it. But something's got to change eventually. So we're recording like Sunday at 4 o'clock-ish local time here in Minnesota. And I've been following on our phone because the wild game just ended. Yep. 
nice three two er, overtime victory over Columbus. And to echo everything that's going on with the Wild, all three goals, of course, broke Kaprizov, which on one hand is great, and I'm happy for us and for the hobby, but literally nobody on our team can score. Besides him, but, wow. But Kaprizov, it's really, really bad at this point. Yeah, so Matt Boldy on the struggle bus. He did have an assist, though, in the game. That's why, that's why I wanted to bring it up. So at least a point. All right, who else is on the struggle bus, Troy? All right. I took one of the Discord suggestions because I hadn't really been following him this year, but I put Jacob Markstrom on the on the struggle bus, the goalie for the Flames. So far, he has had a rough 2023. The, the flip of the calendar has not been good to him. He has a record in 2023 so far of three wins, six losses, four overtime losses, and 13 games played. During the stretch, he has a goals against average of 3.34 and a very low save percentage of 0.872 with no shutouts so far in 2023. On the season, Markstrom has 15 wins, 15 losses, and seven overtime losses with a 2.96 goals against average and a 0.888 save percentage. Anytime that save percentage, even though it's not the most perfect stat in the world, is below 90%, that's a little concerning. I think Markstrom, and I I can't remember if Calgary's in a playoff spot or not, off the top of my head, but obviously it's been kind of a eh season for him. And it seems like 2023 is kind of not started well with only three wins. A couple of Canadian teams have had a rough go of it. Most of the news items I think were earlier in the year on the Canucks, right? What before yes. Boudreau got canned and a lot of drama and kind of uh, interesting quotes coming out of Vancouver there where I think to some extent it might have even overshadowed Calgary a little bit. But then we had, what is it, like a week or so ago where you had Huberto's agent kind of popping off on yeah, Twitter. That's about right, the we did. I forgot about that. I forgot about in, that. In Calgary, and you've got uh, – so, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of fun up there right now. Yeah, I just looked up. The Flames are in fifth place in the Pacific Division with 66 points, so not the greatest season. All right, Markstrom, he's a goalie. Have fun finding his cards. He, his rookie card basically comes down to it's his 2010 SPA Future Watch Auto. It has a PSA 10 pop of one. There's one out there out of eight total graded copies. BGS 9.5 has a pop of nine out of 13 graded copies. So there's not a lot out there. I couldn't find any sales. Raw, you can get it for 60 to 100 bucks, somewhere in there. It, it fluctuates a lot. He's got a sweet helmet paint job, doesn't he? Isn't he one of the ones that. I think so. I think, man, speaking of that, I think every goal is this year's got pretty know. good. They, they, uh, they have been up in their game in the, in the helmet decal department or helmet painting department with all the logos and cool nicknames and all that. You're right. Goalie helmet game, game, very strong. All right. That's who's hot in the struggle bus for this Monday's hockey cards, gong show podcast. Oh, I, I did want to ask you, cause I, I have not yet sort of on-air production meeting, but I think it is going better doing this once a week, don't you? Yes, for sure. I think at two times a week for these, you were, I don't know, it just felt like a little much, and you're kind of, sometimes there wasn't a big, you'd have, two, oh, you almost have too big a group of players too sometimes. So I, I do like the one time a week. I do too. All right, let's roll on to hobby news. We'll start with that little injury roundup. What was your favorite Cole Perfetti moment, Troy? Oh, that he stinks. is out for eight winks. The upper body injury. I wonder if that's code for shoulder. I always speculate shoulder now because shoulder. Like that's it. No head, just shoulder. Oh yeah, it could be that too. Out eight weeks. I suppose he could be back if they went to the playoffs, mm-hmm. but not not a ton of time left in the year. He does have thirty points on the season with eight goals, twenty two assists. Scored more than he's a guy that scored more than a half a goal per game in the OHL, but hasn't had exactly quite the goal scoring touch in the AHL or NHL so far. So, again, this is starting to look at, like, a player's pedigree. And because we know in the hobby, of course, that values tend to gravitate towards goal scorers more than assist producers. That's going to hurt his case for kind of breaking through, especially on the goal side. This year, he was pacing for 48 points. Is only 20 20 years old. So this might be a guy that we put on our list this summer to examine, maybe as a breakout candidate next year. If you're... High on him right now, and you're a big believer or a huge Jets fan. I assume, like what happens with any of these longer term injuries, that his prices will start to come down a little bit. So, 
You might want to target some strike prices to go ahead and snatch them up. Current value try in his 2021 Young Gun PSA 10 pop 557. It's a pretty big pop. The 61% gem rate is $55. So here, if you refer to our gong show rules that you can find on hockeycardsgongshow.com, and our rule number one is be wary of high population counts and run high gem rates when you look at a guy who's still fairly unproven already at 557, 61% gem rate. I would say his young guns is going to be a tough long-term play to build value. If you're, you might want to look at other more scarce cards. If you are a profetti guy, other, I, I don't know how to turn this kind of keep in the injury department, I guess is looks like 2021 rookie goalie. who had a lot of hype. Spencer Knight will be missing some time going forward as he's entered the NHL and NHL PA player assistance program. First thing I'll say is really cool that the NHL and NHL PA have established this way for players to get help when they need it. He can return to the Panthers when cleared to do so by the program administrators. I don't know. Try It feels kind of weird to go through his hockey card values because given what might be going on. So I'm kind of not going to, but all I'll, I'll say is or we bring up stuff like this in case you're in the market. It's beware of what's yep. going on, but hopefully he gets well soon and comes back to hockey um, in short order on the better news front. Uh, Linus Allmark, your guy, Troy, had a quite a day yesterday on Saturday night. Holy cow. Not only did he become the first goalie this season to reach 30 wins, he also scored a goal getting back to Jose Theodore, right? Yep. And the prior instance of an NHL scoring prior to last night with Allmark was Troy's guy, Pekka Rinne, on January 9th, 2020. Boy, Troy is Allmark having just an all-time season, it seems like, so far. Right? The 29-year-old is at, for the season, 1.86 goals against. 0.938 save percentage is 34 and 3. Oh. He's number one in goals against in the NHL. Number one in save percentage. Uh, just ahead of, in save percentage, just ahead of our guy, Philip Gustafson. Nice. Kind of wild to think about. Pardon the pun. And he's number one in wins, of course. From a career perspective, Allmark has played 195 games. He's a 2.53 goals against average and a 0.918 save percentage with a 106, 61, and 16 record. Seems like when you look at like his career season splits over the past three or four years, he's had like average, maybe a little bit above average stats for NHL goalies. So w- when you see a guy go from maybe last year to like 2.3 goals against to 1.86, what, what do you attribute that to, Troy? Is that just. Oh, I, who rock? knows? It could be a bunch of factors. I mean, we know goalies get better later in their career usually. So maybe just now he's hitting his prime obviously boston is an awesome team this year so that obviously plays into it i don't know i'm curious how many shots a game he is averaging i was trying to look it up while i'm talking but it's not going very well Mm. yeah i'd have to do some math quick on the air and i don't want to but yeah i would attribute to that he's probably just getting better and a better team and that stuff's kind of all adding up to this career year i guess if you're looking at it from an investment perspective and he's 29 You'd have to think, what are the odds that he goes from, can repeat this year? Probably not real likely. No, not. I, this is, yeah. he's going to be worse next year, and that's not a knock on him. It's This is, like we said, kind of ridiculousness and what he's and producing this year. I just said the math. He's, I mean, he's facing 29 shots, on average, 29 shots on goal a game. That's not bad. It's not like he's yeah. getting 10. Well, he's, so he's a, from a hockey card perspective, a 2015 young gun. I looked up, okay, I looked up with both this PSA 10 and BGS 9.5. On the PSA 10 front, the pop is only 36, 32% gem rate. Last sold on February 18th for 229 US dollars. There's so few of these that the last sale prior to that, or the sale prior to the last one on February 18th was November of 2021 for 204 US. His 2015 Young Gun BGS 9.5 pop only 15 the seventy percent gem rate, which is weird, right? You have a thirty-two percent gem rate in PSA and <laughs> yeah, it's, I always love when they're just wildly divergent from each other. Yeah, very small sample size, of course. Yeah, but last one for ninety-eight dollars on January sixteenth. Once again, not a lot of these, so very few sales in card ladder where we look. Someone though did get a young gun exclusive. So again, out of a hundred, BGS nine point five this past November, Troy, for a hundred twenty-five US dollars. Good for them. Good deal at that point. Okay, so as a 2015 guy, right, he 
has to have lots of raw copies because they were pumping those out. If Connor McDavid's PSA 10 pop is 2,500, mm-hmm. I don't know what series Allmark was compared to McDavid, but I'm kind of also curious to think or to see, given how he's played this year, how many might be coming through in PSA over the next few months. That, that'll be interesting. But again, 29 years old. Yeah. What do you think it means to Swayman, too? I think they trade him? At some I point, I don't think so. I think I think Swayman is the future, and given Allmark's age, you just never know how much more you got. Is this truly just that one anomaly of a year where he's playing so well, and then next year it would be nice to have Swayman just in case it kind of reverts back to the mean? But it'll be interesting. I, w- I would try to keep Swayman if I was the Bruins. It does seem like a, it's a perfect situation. You got mm-hmm. a veteran who's playing amazing and a very young guy who could be your goalie of the future. Well, speaking of pop reports, Troy, we have not done a Kaprizov Young Gun PSA 10 pop <laughs> count check-in lately. Uh-oh. I know that's disappointing for you, so I apologize for that. His 2020 Young Guns PSA 10 now sits at a pop of 3,285, and that puts him, Troy, only 125 PSA 10s behind the 1990 OPG Premier Yarmir Yager. PSA 10 for the third highest pop count of any hockey card of any grading company of any grade all time. If, and when he does pass Yager, then he would also have the highest PSA pop count for any hockey card too. Excellent. It's good to be number one. (laughs) Well, let's go a little bit deeper because I obviously have no life here. So I looked at the trend report on gemrate.com. He's still adding about 200 PSA 10s per month. Wow. I was going to say, I I figured it'd be another month and he's going to have the record. Maybe sometime in March. We'll we'll get to celebrate that milestone. So when he does, do you think we should, another on-air production meeting, should we dedicate a whole show to it? Oh, man, that'd be a a long show. The show might be 10 minutes, but... Of of you heave crying? (laughs) Okay, getting back to games today. On Sunday, there's a big game this afternoon between the Sabres and Capitals. That in typical Sabres fashion had a ton of action in that they not only score a lot of goals, they also give up a ton of goals, too. It's like every time I see the Sabres in a box score, it's like seven to six or something crazy like that. So in this game, Troy, we had Tage Thompson, TNT, I guess is a proper nickname. Do you love that? Yeah, I like him. Okay. He uh, scored his 40th goal on the season, got to 40 for the first time in his career. He's pacing as of right now to get to like 55, 56, which from a hobby perspective, I think is huge for him maintaining and continuing to grow his values. We also, try had a Dylan Cousins Hattie, which is good timing for anyone that pulled a RPA out of the cup in the last few days. I saw a hat trick. I think he's up to 23 goals on the year now. So, again, your motivational talk this summer to Dylan Cousins has paid dividends. I'm sure his check's in the mail to you, Troy. And then, finally, we had Ovi scoring goal 33 on the year. So, he's getting back to form, getting back from sad news of his dad passing and him leaving the team to go to Russia for a week or so. And I'll, I'll just continue to say Buffalo is so fun to watch and a hundred percent are my Eastern conference team and probably my favorite hobby team right now. Like when I'm looking at box scores, I go right to the Sabres. Yeah. Did you, um, that this is kind of related to the Sabres, but I saw it on Twitter. I think it's true or it's real. Did you see the billboard that Delaware North? I think that's a, maybe a healthcare company put out. No. Um, so it says top three hard things to say, and it's basically trying to, get people like mental health awareness and being more open, but it says top three hard things to say. One, I was wrong. Two, I need help. Three, Uka Pekka Lukanen. <laughs> I think that's just, <laughs> that's just a fantastic billboard. And I'm pretty sure it was real. Maybe it's not, but maybe it's some, someone Photoshopped it, but it looks funny if it, if it's not. Well, can I play NHL GM for a second? Let's do it. We know that right. Arizona's tanking for Bedard. And part of their problem is they keep winning. <laughs> part of that problem is their goalies have been better than they probably would like them to be. And I've heard that Carol Vizmelka, right? Yep. Could be available, but he's on like a still, I think, a real low rookie contract. I wouldn't the Sabres trade for him because that's the thing they need is goaltending. Yeah. Might make the playoffs because they ain't taking for Bedard at this point. No, they're not. Of course. Okay. Well, if you're listening, Buffalo GM, maybe do that. Okay, I got to talk about this Patrick Kane situation a little bit here in Hobby News. Is this the longest trade that's ever happened? I don't think so. I mean, we just known he's been 
ever since the season started, he's been on everyone's list of someone that could get traded at the end of the season or near the trade deadline, I should say. And now that we know that it sounds like it's in the works, I think Kevin Weeks reported that it's pretty much getting well, close to the finish going line. For a week now. Oh, there's been longer trades. I promise you there's been longer trades that have been in the works before. I think it's just you, now in social media world, we get instant maybe. access and hear about all the stuff behind the news all the time. So I think that's Did you what, see the report last night that he flew home and left the team? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, they're going to, if I'm New York and I'm going to trade for him and I'm telling Chicago, I'm like, he's not playing. He's not playing until he gets to our team because I don't need him getting injured. Does that make him look bad in your mind to just hop on a plane and say, I'm out? Yeah, I wonder how, back. I wonder if that was a directive from the team, maybe. Because if it was truly him, I think that looks kind of bad. But again, I'm not an NHL player. I don't know what they go through and all this stuff that goes on with these trade negotiations. I just get the feeling because I've been, you know, I'm a tea leaf reader and I've been trying to read the tea leaves over the past week. And that there's like some hurt feelings about this. Like maybe it's either him not handling it real well or someone in the Chicago side is being kind of a hole ish towards him or something because Mm. it just feels like that not quite as professional maybe as it should be i don't know if that's even how accurate that is or not but that's just kind of my read on the situation i just want this over with it's like yeah read the guy already yeah we don't need like oh he's not practicing or he skipped the team meal you know now he's flying on back on a home now these people on the ranger side didn't join the team prayer before the game and it's just like so how much not- so if he goes to the rangers now we're gonna have dual cane laffy cards that are gonna come out how much does Laffy take down the value of the cane card? Did you see our last Instagram post that was like four minutes before a show? I did. I can't. I don't have time. I don't get time. This is my like oh, worst stop. couple days of my life for time. But now I, I, I need to follow up. I'm going to have like all night no, tonight no, okay. to look at check, Instagram. No, check your phone right now because it's very, it's very apropos to what we're talking about. So one of the bigger sales out of the cup so far. Oh, is it Laffy? It's Laffy and Kaprizov. Dual RPA. Oh, okay. Oh, for I like see fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. Yep. yep, got it. Or do yeah, we yeah. get the new guy, Patrick Kane, Tarasenko patch autos? That'd be kind of cool, huh? You know what's funny? I'm looking at this car, or your post, and poor Lafayette, that horrible signature, and now he had to try to get it <laughs> in such a small little space because that dual auto rookie Mark Shield is massive. It's huge. On the car. Huge so you can see, car. like, at the end, he has to, like, kind of go upwards a little bit to get it all on there. If you want to see it, go to our Instagram and check out the post. You can see the card. The things that humor me about cards. It's just got to. It's just got to end. Okay, so I'm I'm making a public plea to the Blackhawks, Rangers, and Patrick Kane to get this done, so we can move on with their lives and see the nice little spike in his cards, and then move on. Last thing I want to mention, Troy, in hobby news is we haven't talked about the hockey index and card ladder in a while. After spending a lot of last year in the green or positive. The card letter hockey index is down about 3% over the past month and 5.32% over the past three months. I was looking through the cards that make up their hockey index, and it looks like it's really the past 10 days or so that have been pretty rough. So I don't know what that means. Is it the cup war chesting where people stop spending? Could be. To buy the cup? Or is there something to like the, I've heard in other sports, people speculate of like the all-star game lull. That for some reason, you know, there's so much excitement at the beginning of the season, then you get kind of this lull around the All-Star game, and then excitement picks up as you then go into the playoffs and, of yeah. course, that sort of thing. So no idea, but something to watch, I guess, over the next month or so. And again, if you go back to being down 3% over the past month, you can compare that to baseball, which is basically even, which probably isn't great because Series 1 just came out a week ago, mm-hmm. and you think that there'd be a little bit more of a spike there. Golf Troy is up about 2%, and I don't know if that has to do with the Netflix documentary that's similar to the F1 that came out recently. Tennis is up 1.5%, and I know you're a great tennis card mind, Troy, so you want to explain that one? If it's not a Jennifer Capriati card, I don't care. Not even Monica Sellas? She only got stabbed. Yeah, and grunts a lot. when. Yeah, that was... was... Should we start yeah. a tennis card podcast? Would that be fun? <laughs> there was a time when I did watch a lot of tennis. There was like that year. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe early 2000s. I think maybe I was watching a lot of tennis, but it's a great okay. sport. I mean, it's fun to watch. I feel like we can learn something about you every show. That's part of why I love doing this. Hockey, though, is still ahead in the past month of soccer, which is down 3.78%. MMA, down 3.86%. Basketball, down 5.47%. And football is yeah. the worst producing. It's 
down 7.32. Football kind of makes sense because now Super Bowl's over and oh, yeah, the off-season dip. Off-season started. Okay, the weekly Slab Sharks auction is up. I want to preview that real quickly. They are, a, of course, a gong show partner and sponsor. Canadian eBay consigner that make it super easy to sell your cards and avoid the typical hassles like responding to buyer questions, getting paid, and shipping, especially when you're trying to ship cards to the U.S. from Canada via eBay. You can check out their information for consignment on their new website, slabsharks.com, or on their Instagram account. They do sell them the cards, especially the hockey ones, which are awesome, via their weekly auctions on eBay that end on Thursday nights. Their current auction is live, and Troy, there's some pretty awesome cards in it. And I found a few yesterday that I always have a hard time stopping (laughs) when I make these lists because I get completely sucked into the rabbit hole here. They have a 2015 Trilogy Rookie Premieres Triple Auto. Check this out. 2015 Trilogy Rookie Premieres Triple Auto. Connor McDavid, Dylan Larkin, Max Domi. Out of 25 BGS9. That's a cool card, huh? There's also a 2015 Premier Artemi Panarin Gold Rookie Patch Auto out of 10. That is a ridiculous patch. If you do nothing, go to eBay, search for the Slab Sharks auction, and look at this patch. Again, 2015 Premier Panarin Gold out of 10. It's, it's one of the feathers. This is yeah, awesome. I- there is a, a 2020 OPG Platinum Kirill Kaprizov coming off a hat trick Seismic Gold Auto out of 25 raw. That's a I would love that card. Oh, I was going to say something. Remember Seismic Gold? I think, did you have a post recently where we talked about it where sometimes the autos go for less than the regular cards? Yeah. I yeah. think I'm in that. I think I'm in that boat where I like the regular ones better. Right. <laughs> but this one, uh, is, I'd take this anything cool. with Kaprizov. Yeah. I would take. There's a 2009 The Cup. You ever heard of The Cup? I think so. Okay, good. John Tavares, limited logos out of 50 RPA with a three color patch. Very nice if you're a Tavares fan. 2019, the Cup Exquisite Collection, Quinn Hughes, RPA out of 43. It's a four color patch. Crazy. Then, last one that I found that was a, a 2019 OPG Platinum, Jack Hughes, Rainbow Color Wheel. That's the EPAC one. I love those Rainbow Color Wheel cards. And that's a PSA 10. There's a ton of um, So just go to, you can either go to eBay, search for Slab Sharks eBay, or Google, I mean, search for Slab Sharks eBay, or go to slabsharks.com and see all the cards that end this Thursday night. Well, speaking of the cup, Troy, let's get into our initial thoughts and reactions. Yeah. This and I think be. the way we'll, <laughs> we'll do this is just more of like a, like a brain dump, or I don't know if there's an order necessarily to this. It's kind of free flowing discussion well yeah i'll follow your lead because i i will admit i did not see a lot i know the big issues i know what we're going to talk about but i didn't see a lot of the cards. i didn't watch a lot of breaks or anything well i'm gonna start with the positives because i like to be a positive guy i'm actually a big fan of like the designs of a lot Mm -hmm. of the cards and the configurations like the stuff i'm seeing on instagram on ebay you can tell why everyone loves the cup these cards are freaking awesome yeah they're just amazing and then to see so many elite players in these amazing cards and I know the checklist is big and we're seeing the best of the best in Instagram posts, but it is pretty fun to open up Instagram now or Facebook or wherever you go to see stuff like this and check out some of the players. The biggest issue, of course, is the sticker autos. A lot of hubbub, a lot of hobby drama. Hobby drama. Hobby drama. The big bummer, of course, for lots of collectors and us wild fans is Kaprizov. Looks like all his autos are stickers as well as Sorokin. Other Russian players, so there seems to be a Russian tie-in to that. Seen a lot of the printing plate booklets. So that's where they take anywhere from base cards to, I think, on the better side, like Young Guns, where it's a booklet that has all four CMYK printing plates. So Mm. cyan, yellow, black, and magenta. Those are kind of cool. I don't know. I have no idea, though, Troy, what the long-term hobby value of those will be. I haven't necessarily seen any sell yet either. And I'm not even sure what the hobby sentiment is is on them at this point, but I kind of like them. I'm a you know, I have the world's most ridiculous printing plate, my <laughs> invisible Tim Stutzla. That made me a forever a printing plate fan. I, I've seen a lot of those. Some huge cards have already been pulled. So the Kaprizov Shield Auto 101 sticker has already been pulled. And the McDavid Shield Auto 101, that's been pulled as well. Oh, I was waiting for the on card auto. I was waiting for the on card under your breath. That is on card. Looks like J Rob has a lot of redemptions. There was a Foundations Quad Auto out of 15, and then it sold for 1500 I think the biggest sale so far is a J-Rob Redemption that's an exquisite RPA out of 21 That sold for 3800 US. Well, yeah, being J-Rob's Redemption, that probably means, oh, wait, we got to get this guy in here. Let's... 
let's see how we, what's the best way to get J-Rob into the cup. And they had to go the redemption route, it looks like. So we are talking with Billy Cilio tomorrow. We're recording with him Monday, today, time vortexing again, for Thursdays for our next episode. I am kind of curious to ask him why they went redemption with J-Rob and sticker with other guys. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a reason, but just kind of curious to know. Lots of buying and breaking. I saw tons of breakers where I go through. Talked to some breakers that went through 15, 16 boxes or tins, however you term the cup in the first day and a half, right? So the interest has definitely been there, and people have been... Yeah, that's why it's not surprising to see, like, the Caprice Off Shield and the McDavid Shield already pulled. Just looking at one source, whatnot, I was I just looked to see how many people were breaking, and there was tons. Every break had the cup, so it, it makes sense. A lot of, I mean, it's good. It's good that people are breaking, but also I wonder if that's led to that 1200 whatever, $49 price, U.S. dollars, which stinks. Yeah, we'll get into some collector polls that we did in a second that get, I guess, your guys, if you're listening, feedback on value and some of the other stuff, too. I already mentioned from a programming note, we plan to have Billy Celio from Upper Deck on Thursday's show. And then the fall, next week, we're also working to schedule a conversation with Carvin Chung, who is the creator of the Cup and Exquisite when he was at Upper Deck. Kind of get some of the fun origin story. He has some amazing stories. So we're continuing our The Cup coverage for sure. I already mentioned that the J-Rob Exquisite Redemption is the biggest sale so far at 3800 US. So we haven't seen any of the big, big, big cards that have sold. We saw One Not Breaker we know, Money Moose, right? She had pulled a Kaprizov Tribute, like 05 Tribute RPA out of 10. So that's another big one that I've seen. I've heard, I think somebody said maybe the Cousins Field 101 Auto has been pulled, maybe. Not sure on that. It's still early, right? The Cup's been out three days. I mentioned a second ago, we did some Instagram polls to see what you guys think of the Cup so far. Had tons of votes. I think the most votes we've ever had on our polls. I love doing these polls. I just think it's so much fun to see what people think. So I asked three questions yesterday. The first one was on card design and set configuration. And the options were love it, pretty good, okay, been better, or don't like it. And... The top vote getter was OK, been better at 42%. And if you if you kind of break it into, well, there's four choices. The first two are more on the positive. The second two are more on the negative. The love it and pretty good responses were 34%. And then you have 66% that were a little more on the negative, which, again, surprises me. I don't know if just if the if the kind of the mood around the cup is because of all the anticipation and how could it ever live up to the expectations is a little dour at this point, and that sentiment might change yeah. because I definitely feel the cards look awesome. Or if people are more basing that on set configuration and size of checklist, yeah, I don't know. When you look at the designs, are, what are your thoughts so far of the cards you've seen? I, I think they look good. However, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer because I've never ripped previous products of the cup. I would like to see more cards in person. I've seen them at card shows and stuff, but I think they've been fine. I'm not. I don't love them. I don't hate them. I think they're fine. The second question we asked is. How big of an issue are the sticker autos? So I had three choices here, Troy. Huge deal. I'm indifferent and not a big deal. Winner with a bullet, not to my surprise, is huge deal at 76% of the votes. Yeah, I wish I uh, could go into a parallel reality or a parallel universe and see the universe where Upper Deck announces beforehand that there are going to be sticker autos for those two. Does that affect this poll result? Because that's one thing people have complained about, too. Mm-hmm. That it's sticker autos, we're used to. I get it's a premium product. Maybe it shouldn't have it. But I'm also hearing, or we're also hearing there's some hurt feelings that they didn't announce it before that these two or three, however your players are going to have sticker autos. So I'm curious yeah. if that changes, but it seems about right. And then the last question we asked was price versus value. And again, four choices to vote on here. Great value, good value, 50-50. Or poor value. So good value got 2% of the vote. Or great value got 2% of the vote. Good value got 9% of the vote. 50-50 got 19% of the vote. And 70% is poor value. But that's, I, I kind of expect yep. that, though. You're not spending $1,250 US on a box and expecting to break even. And if you are, you shouldn't. You really shouldn't. Yeah. It's, you rip the cup because they're awesome cards. And you, you like the cup and you want to have fun ripping a high-end product. It is great to have it out, though. It is great to have these cards out. And I can't wait to continue to follow the secondary market and see 
where the values shake out on these and who people are chasing. One thing I've noticed too is that Lafreniere values are pretty strong. <laughs> Some there of the sales there you go. have been Lafreniere cards. And again, people just can't quit this guy. I'm not saying you should. It just amazes me that he, in the short time you and I have followed this hobby to the level that we are, there's no precedence that I've seen of a guy that has produced so little with a value so high. <laughs> Crazy. Speaking on or keeping on the new product releases theme, we'll switch over to that. It still looks like OPG paper is next, March 1st. Checklist is out, as we talked about on our last show. I did hear, Troy, that all the autos in OPG are hard signed. <laughs> are there even too, any too autos in OPG paper? No, I don't <laughs> think so. Too soon for a joke like that? <laughs> Maybe there'll be a hidden one. And then the other set that looks like it's coming out, what is it, March 8th? Yep is SP Signature Edition Legends, which is kind of a foreign set to us. The checklist is out there, and you did a whole deep dive into it. So I'll kind of pass the conch to you and let you roll with it, Matt. Yeah, deep dive means I read the sell sheet. Because I I will be completely honest, this was a product that I think slipped under our, our radar and we didn't have that much familiarity with. So, I thought this was a Canada-only product at one point. Am I oh, wrong? really? Maybe it was. Maybe I'm wrong. But what I will say and why I really want you to do this, because to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, this is a product that seems completely up your alley. Oh, yeah. I'm all, I've already. <laughs> so I did this review and immediately went on to like an online retailer and I have boxes in my cart. I haven't bought them yet, but I will buy them. So, yeah, this, okay. this definitely right. is right up my alley. So it's 2020, 21 SP Signature Edition Legends. So, again, it's a 2020 product. In doing the research, I, the first thing I do is I download the spreadsheet. I just want to look how many different cards, 2,438. But per the marketing, this is the largest checklist of retired legends the market has seen in years. So I, I like So they're that. marketing that as a good thing. Yeah, they're marketing that as a good thing. Is it a good thing? I'm not saying it isn't, but it's just curious to me that that would well, I wonder if, be the case. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, see, I don't know this product. I don't know if they like skipped any years previously, but I'm all for retired people on <laughs> newer cards. I'm just a sucker. This is right up my alley. And looking at the set configuration, I just want to throw this out first before I look at the box break on average stuff. But each hobby box contains at least two autographs on average. So I like that. Now, again, look at the checklist. There are some guys on there you're going to be like, whoa, that guy was in the NHL, but yes. All right, the base set, 451 card base set includes 300 common cards, 50 short prints. And then of these 300, these first 350 cards, they have gold foil base parallels as well. And then some of those select base and base short print players have gold spectrum foil autographs. So there you go. Oh. Rest of the base set repurposes Upper Deck's popular Future Watch subset to honor all-time grades. So this will be 351 to 451. They'll be numbered to 199 or less. They'll have the base all-time Future Watch autos, and they kind of split them into three different tiers of rarity. You got to look at the checklist to figure out what they're talking about. Again, it's I don't know if it's kind of weird to see like legends on a Future Watch card. It did. It, it took me a couple seconds to look at the picture, but it seems kind of odd. So it's like a Mike Bossy Future Watch auto, is what you're saying. <laughs> it's kind of stuff like that where it's just like, all right, it is a little weird, but. Just go read the checklist because you'll see some stuff behind there that is kind of interesting. So that's the base set. Then there's the inserts, and I'm just going to read these. They have behind the boards is an insert. Covers former players who became coaches. Now, I want a behind the stripes and have former players who became referees, and it's probably like five people. Wait, who's the guy from our PWCC preview that was a great... King Clancy, right? Yeah, Francie Clancy. Francie Clancy. All there right, there's also the Evolve insert. Observes three different points in a player's career, rookie, middle season, and final season, where possible. Just love this sell sheet stuff. There's Decacons, which showcases top players from past decades. Dominant. That'd be like a trans, that's like a transformer name. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. Uh, there's Dominant Digits, celebrates retired stars and their jersey numbers, obviously. They also are doing, they're bringing in UD Canvas Legend cards. So obviously we're familiar with the canvas. Now they're going to have some of these in with the retired stars of this product. And then they also have another insert called Life After Hockey, which is kind of interesting. All these inserts, there's usually gold foil parallels. There is autographs, lots of on-card autos, and they were <laughs> lots of on-card. I need, I need to throw that uh, quote up, on-card. 
So there's the 97 Legend Signatures. This is a living set. So it's just a continuation of previous products. They just keep going right down the line. There's the Century Legend Signatures, which these are the cards that you can have. One signature, dual signature, triple signature, quad signatures. Many of the inserts are also issued as hard signed autograph parallels. So you are going to have tons and tons of autos on this thing. There's also the bounty program. I'm not going to read it. Go out to Upper Deck site if you want to know what's going on. There is a chance. I think you can earn, yeah, you get gold parallel sets and all this stuff. Just go read about it. I don't want to give, I'm not going to go into that spiel. All right, here's the box breakdown. So in one hobby box, on average, two autographs, one rare hit card, three base gold foil parallels, four UD canvas legend inserts, three dominant digit inserts, three additional inserts, and one profiles UD bounty card. Release date, March 8, 2023. Pre-order pricing, I looked at David Adams and Steel City in the U.S., and it's 200 U.S. dollars. Or actually, $199, $199.95. It's pretty pricey as far as how It is pricey. Compared to... But I love it. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots No, of this is a set made for Troy. Yeah, this is... Did the sell sheet have your name on it? Did it say for <laughs> Gong Show Troy, Troy on there? No, I just love the retired stuff and kind of in newer mm-hmm. cards and sets. I'm all for it. Be interesting to see how many sales, not even even the amounts, like how many people buy these cards on the secondary market, or if it's more of a collecting kind of thing where you rip it to keep it. Sort of. I would feel it's more collecting, but that's just me. Okay, I want to give a quick mention to Gong Show sponsor partner PWCC. The new PWCC weekly auction is up. Head to pwccmarketplace.com, check it out. We will do a preview of the auction on Thursday show and highlight some of the best cards. Like we always do. It's one of my more favorite things we do on our show. There's a bunch of awesome vintage and modern hockey cards in this week's auction. If you're not the auction type, there's also about 4,200 hockey cards in the PWCC fixed price marketplace. And finally, their vaulting service, which that is integrated relationships with grading companies SGC, DGS, and CSG, make it easy to get your raw cards graded and stored in a safe, secure vault where they can sit and build value, or you can List them on the fixed marketplace and the weekly or premier auctions very easily. And all of this, Troy, can be done at pwccmarketplace.com. For our last segment in today's show, I wanted to do a little bit of a breakdown and have kind of a hockey card tie-in to The Athletic, which did their top 99 list over the past, I think, few weeks. This is one of those, I think, where they released a few at a time. Did you ever have, or did, have you had a chance to check this out recently on The Athletic website or... I have. I'm going to make one quick correction. Or not a correction. I want to add one thing to my SP Signature Legends thing. I forgot to say this. The box breakdown is five cards per pack, 18 packs per box. I forgot to put that in there. But now back to this thing. Yes, I have. Actually, when doing research on some of the greatest number players, I've actually used this these articles to help with that. I have not went through and read every one of them, but I've definitely seen it out there and clicked on a couple here and there when it interested me or I needed to for research purposes. It's behind a pay- the athletic paywall, mm-hmm. so you have to have a subscription. If you're a hockey fan and you want to keep up with the game and you love reading really good writing and good articles, I, I definitely think it's worth it to get a su- subscription. So their NHL 99 is really a top 100 list, but what they said is that only 99 spots are up for debate because the one spot is pretty boring in that we all know it's Wayne Gretzky. The other thing that's interesting about this list is that they specifically chose the post-1967 expansion era. So you have no Gordie Howe, Rocket Richard, Howie Morins, any type of fancy, fancy clancy kind of guys, right? And, and their rationale for choosing the post-1967 expansion era was they felt like going back further was just covering the same territory that's been done so many times before. They said that it's when the NHL went from 6 to 12 teams, and in the words of The Athletic, when the game and the business of hockey fundamentally changed. And finally, again, in their words, instead of a league dominated almost exclusively by Canadians, a trickle and eventually a flood of players arrived from every corner of the world. So do you think there's a huge distinction post-1967, pre-1967, or maybe that's a Jeremy Lee type question? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I agree with their reasoning. When you add the number of teams and then kind of look at where we're at now with 32, and you get an influx of players, and like they said, we're not just Canada, or the NHL is not just Canada anymore. It's all corners of the world. So yeah, I'm all, I'm on board with it. I can get behind their reasoning. So for our purposes, I thought we'd take a look at their ranking of the top 10 
post-1967 expansion era players and see, number one, try if we agree, and then do the little hockey card tie-in. And we'll look and see kind of maybe the order changes by looking at their hockey card values too. So the top 10 NHL players, according to The Athletic, in the 1967 post-expansion era, Project R, Q, drum roll. Thank you. We'll go from 10 to 1. You nervous, Troy? How's it going to shake out? I'm not nervous. Or, I feel good. Okay. All right. Number 10 was Ray Bork. We'll just, we'll just go through these and digest them and then come back to it. Number 9, Phil Esposito. We talked about today one of the six players, or five players to ever score 150 points in a season. Number 8, Nicholas Lidstrom. Number 7, Dominic Hasek. Number 6, Alex Oviovechkin. Number 5, Yarmir Yager. Number 4, Sidney Crosby. Three is Bobby Orr, two Super Mario, Mario Lemieux, and one Wayne Gretzky. So I think there's a couple ways to analyze this. First, you look at some of the more notable names that did not crack the top 10. Names like Patrick Waugh, who was number 11, according to The Athletic. Mike Bossy, number 12. Guy Lafleur, number 14. Stevie Y, the captain. El Capitan, number 15. Connor McDomer, number 16. And then if you go back and you look at these guys, you can say, okay, Gretzky, Lemieux, or total givens. And when maybe the final three, so number nine, 10, 9, and 8, where you had Ray Bork, Phil Esposito, Nicholas Lidstrom, would those be the more questionable, debatable ones, let's call it? So when you look at those guys, Ray Bork, Phil Esposito, Nicholas Lidstrom, and you think of the guys left off the list, like Patrick Waugh, Mike Bossy, Guy Lafleur, Stevie Y, would you make any changes there, Troy, personally? I don't know. I, I don't, not with Esposito. Esposito was a legend. That guy deserves to be in the top 10. I mean, his career point total is 1,590. I was just looking it up because I remember it was pretty big. So I, I can be fine with Esposito. I think where you get the debates are the Ds because Bork and Lidstrom, they're going to get a lot of credit for being just really good defensemen. Obviously, they had points too, but sometimes it's really hard to quantify how good of an actual defense when you were and playing your position being in the right spot with these kind of lists because the first thing everyone gravitates to is towards points so i think well speaking of d's i did email the athletic and let them know that they forgot about most sites <laughs> oh man and <laughs> i will say mcdavid will probably be in the top 10 list when he retires probably if his career yeah. keeps going the way it is so they put lidstrom ahead of bork even in the top 10 right they you know bork I, 10, I think i lidstrom had at eight yeah you know i think i had to read the lidstrom one and they make a good argument for it. I mean, he was just – it. It his career was so quiet. He was a quiet person, I think, that we, a lot of times we forget how good he was. So I actually – I'm okay with that one. A couple other interesting kind of like where they fell in the ranking type ones. You have at number five – no, six, seven. <laughs> you have a number seven. So you just you you name, you name off numbers. You'll get it I'll right. I'll just go through all the numbers. <laughs> you have Dominic Hasek coming at number seven. Yeah. Patrick Waugh at number 11. You agree with that? I agree with that 100%. Uh, Hasek, obviously, I think Hasek is, he has the highest save percentage of all time. And I believe he has the highest goals, or the lowest goals against average of any, like, modern player. There's a lot of, there's some goalies above him, but they were all played in the mm-hmm. 20s and the 30s. And I'm just looking at it right now, if he would be, his all-time goals against for his regular season is 2.2 which puts him seventh all time. But first, if you look at modern era, if you look at anyone in the 1950s and after. Sure. So I can get on board with that one too. Hashtag, it is amazing how good he was. and Very spunky in uh, geopolitical conversations these days too. Yep, you got he's him. having an opinion on everything. He's, got, he's definitely got his opinions. Okay, the next one for you is this. I'm going to go through again, according to The Athletic, in their top 10, number six, five, and four, and I want to see if you agree with the rankings or if you would change any of these up at all. So again, number six was Ovechkin, five, Yager, four, Crosby. Is that the order in your mind, or do you make any changes there? Yeah, I can. I mean, if anything, maybe I would flip Yager and Crosby, but I don't have a really good reason. I think just Yager gets credit for playing for 30-some years and always producing. I just Do so you think Yager is better than Ovechkin? If no, you're starting a team... No, I would rather have Ovi, I think. Yeah, I think I would go, again, so the order they did in highest rank to lowest rank is they had Ovechkin at six, Yager at five, Crosby at four. I think I would go Yager, Ovechkin, Crosby. 
But am I giving Crosby too much credit? No, I, Crosby's one of those players. I just, I don't. I always hold a grudge against him, but he's so good. He's really good, and he's been so good for so long. I think he's right where he should be. And I'm assuming too, you have no problem with or Lemieux Gretzky, right? That's no, no, no. Be kind of sacrilege to and and Gordy Howe can't be a part of it because he's not. He's pre 1967 expansion. Yeah, so. you'll you'll see some <laughs> people on debating about oh, Gretzky's on, or not Gretzky. Uh, Lemieux's on number two and. Bobby Orr is better than him, but whatever. I just different, it's such different times that they, those two played him and they were the, they're both expect post expansion players, but I am totally on board with or Lemieux Gretzky. So now let's go through the top 10 again and let's bring in their rookie card values just for fun. I'm not even sure what this means, but I just think it'll be fun to compare and contrast and highlight a couple of things that were part of this. So going back, starting at number 10 again, you got Ray Bork. I kind of went with their most valuable mm-hmm. rookie card what its current value is. So he's a 1980 OPG. He has a PSA 10, a pop 32 goes for about 7,800 us. Phil Esposito, 1965 tops PSA nine. I think there's one PSA 10, but it's never sold. The PSA nine pop is 23, 5,160 us dollars current value. That's probably a good based on your yeah. sentiment and thoughts of that. Seems like that might be a decent buy. Yeah. You read that. And I, I just, in my head, I thought that looked a little tad low. So, this is the one for me. So we'll go back to the Lindstrom versus Bork and what you read about Lindstrom and your feelings on him. He's a 1991 OPG Premier. I believe it's a Team Canada one, I think. PSA 10, Troy, pop 256, 58 US dollars. Yep. Now let's linger on this one for a second. Number one, it's crazy to think about the number eight player post expansion era. Their rookie cards were 50 bucks and a gem mint. And then the second thing I mentioned is that a pop 256, Kaprizov has like $7 million and he's worth $300-ish. Yep. 256 is not a high pop. <laughs> no. and For a guy with over 1,000 points, over 1,500 games played. Can I say something controversial for a minute? Oh, do it. All right. I've felt for a while now, and my conviction is only getting stronger, that there's some lower pop count, quote-unquote, junk era cards that I think are... Seriously, I don't want to use the word undervalued, but underappreciated. And that the the comeback is always the same. Oh, there's a billion sitting around. Yeah, I have, there's a bunch in like, boxes. And if the values go up a little bit, they're all just going to get submitted. And now you're going to be able to pop 10,000 before you know it. There could be 3,000 more of these. And there still wouldn't be as many as a Capri South Young, <laughs> which is kind of funny and sad for you, of course. Yes. But yeah, it's you've got... According to them, the number eight player of all time, a guy better than Ray Borg, top two, five, six. It's not thousands, millions, billions. It's 256. All right, I'm done. Four-time cup winner, seven-time Norris Trophy winner. <laughs> like, it's just, it's crazy. You know, we think of Stamkos as the yeah. guy that yeah. gets no appreciation. It's like, holy buckets. Then you go to Hasek, who is at number seven. He's a 1991, again, another junk era guy. His upper deck PSA 10 pop 1,115, a lot, five times, four times. The size of Lidstrom, but still worth more. Many, many cards. Jack Hughes has more than double the pop of Dominic Hashik, 96 US dollars. At number six, you have Alex Oviovechkin, 2005, of course, Young Gun PSA 10, pop 1,095, what, 20 less than Dominic Hashik, 5,495 <laughs> US dollars. If today is your first day in the hobby and I give you this list, you're like, what the? This hobby makes no sense. Again, there's context. There's appreciation for the era. We know. I don't think I need the lecture as to why, yeah. but it is still. Tell me it makes sense because I just don't think it does. Even if you're 30 years in the hobby, you could look at this list and <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Next guy, continue our third our third junk wax air guy, number five, Yarmir Yager, who's a 1990 OPG Premier PSA 10. Top 3,409. This is the one that now this is the one real high one. 181 US dollar. It's just the goal scoring thing, yeah. right? Because you have Lidstrom at 56, Asha got 96. This goes back to our Gontro rules that the hobby prefers goal scores. Yeah. 181 bucks. Makes no sense that that's other than that, that that's $181 value versus Lidstrom at 56 with a pop that's 12 times less. Number four is Sidney Crosby, 2005 Young Gun PSA 10, pop 943, 3,300 US dollars. Big difference now between Ovechkin at fifty four ninety five US versus thirty three hundred. So much of the goals record is baked into that. Mm-hmm. Again, Abby 
you ask why does the hobby prefer goal scores? Yes. From an, an accomplishments and awards perspective, Ovechkin can't touch Crosby. It's hard to even assume that he'll win another cup at this point. I've watched a few games of the Capitals and they're not, they're not great. I can't, I can't see him winning, right? But well, that's how much we love goal scores. Almost 80% higher value. Then the three big ones, the Bobby Orr 1966 tops PSA 9, Pop 1, 204,000. The Mario Lemieux 85 OPG PSA 10, Pop 48, 43,000. And of course, the 1979 OPG Wayne Gretzky Pop PSA 10, Pop 2, last sale was like 3.75 million. Do you think that it surprised you that Lemieux's PSA 10 isn't worth more? Is the fact that there's 48 of them? Yeah. It's, make it seem I, like if you did like a market cap kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's. Just because there's a lot of them, not a lot of them, but there's more than one or two or ten. So I think that that price sounds right to me. It does. I don't think it should be more. And I don't know if like Hasek or Lidstrom will ever get the Lidstrom will ever be worth a thousand dollars. Well, probably not. But if you want to own an amazing all time legendary rookie card of a pretty cool set, right? The OPG Premier set from the ninety and ninety one were pretty awesome. It, it costs basically less than it. Takes to take your family out to dinner. <laughs> I don't know. Kind of fun. I always like looking at doing these. Oh, yeah. Well, that is the show for Monday. If you like the episode, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show and how could you not, we learned more about Troy and his tennis watching habits today, which is really exciting. You should then consider a $5 a month donation via Patreon and become a patron of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. Join our out of 99 support level tier. You can do so by going to HockeyCardsGongShow.com and clicking on the Become a Patron link, going to the Patreon website directly, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. There's also a link in the show description for the podcast app you're listening to us on right now. Or in our Instagram and TikTok profiles, we have a link tree that has links to our Patreon site there, too. If you're not following us on social media, you should, I think. And you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures, LLC. We will see you all Thursday later. <laughs>